Good morning, Charles. Well, thank you, Charles, for taking the time to come and join us this morning. I know we've had plenty of conversations in the past, and I've always been curious to kind of open up the, com the conversation to a more public audience. So, uh, yeah, really looking forward to our conversation today. Um, so really, yeah, the way that these interviews start, it's really understanding a bit about you and your journey, Charles. How did you get to the position you're in and your vision for the future? So, yeah, I'd love to sort of start by understanding kind of, yeah, how did you get into land management? Yeah, what are you up to now and what's your vision for the future? Uh, thank you, Tim. That's that's quite a quite a narrow question to start <laughs> with, isn't it? How did I get into land management? By accident, I think it's probably fair to say. I went to a boarding school in Suffolk when I was 11 years old. My father was a soldier, so there was the possibility he would move around. The boarding school was um, run by the London Education Authority for boys from London who would benefit somehow from a boarding school education. We were a mixed group of uh, military children like myself, children from one parent families, children from all sorts of diverse backgrounds really and uh, the school itself was in a lovely setting above the river Orwell and it looked down over the Orwell it was a Palladian mansion that had been built in 1776 and it had been the centerpiece of a large estate which filled just about all of the Shotley Peninsula between the rivers Orwell and Stour and as I got older and we all had to think about what we were going to do after school I decided I really didn't want to um, spend my working life in London or anywhere like London. And I did want to spend my working life in somewhere like the environment I was at school at. I'd never heard of estate management or land agents or anything like, like that, but somehow I stumbled my way to the discovery of land agency as a career. And um, even more unwittingly uh, stumbled into the Royal Agricultural College at Sirencester. Um, at the time, it was the only institution which offered a specific rural estate management course. Um, one thing led to another, and um, I qualified as a chartered surveyor, uh, and uh, I worked for the Ministry of Agriculture's advisory service. I'd done a stint as a research assistant at the Royal Agricultural College. That was when I first began to be interested in environmental matters. Um, from the Ministry of Agriculture, they wanted me to move to Essex from Cheshire to uh, fill in holes in the ground, which I didn't fancy very much. So I went to work for uh, the government as a, as a valuer for the district valuers office. And then Harper Adams beckoned in the late 1980s. Um, because Harper Adams was starting another rural estate management course and I thought it would be very interesting and enjoyable to be in at the very start of that. It was only the second one of its type in the country and the first of its specific type because it had a placement, yeah, and I thought that was a great idea. Um, and uh, I stayed at Harper probably rather longer than I thought I would when I first went there. I was there the best part of 30 years before I retired from Harper Adams. Um, but about 10 years ago, I got the opportunity to be involved in a project on Exmoor in the, the southwest there. It was a project looking at the restoration of peatland uh, for management of the water system in the southwest. It came about by what was virtually a chance meeting with Professor Mark Reed on Crew Station. I don't live far from Crew. I live in a town called Nantwich in South Cheshire. And we had 10 minutes chatting to each other on Crew Station while he changed trains. And um, from that came the project on Exmoor, which was my introduction to practical work, really with ecosystem services which has evolved since then into the world of natural capital as we know it um, now but but looking back it's it's you ask about a vision of land management and i'm i'm not sure my fragmented thoughts amount to as much a vision tim but uh, but for what they're worth it's interesting to look across my career and see how things have evolved. The work I was employed at Cyrusester as a research assistant on 
was looking at the impact of the Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1981 on farmers, in particular the role of management agreements under which farmers were, were paid not to drain sites of special scientific interest. Um, when I went to work for the Minerva Ag Fish and Food, we were still on the very last days of paying grants for land drainage, new buildings, all sorts of agricultural improvement things, and very exciting it was in, it, in its way. But in 1983, the ministry moved me to Cheshire, and in 1984, milk quotas um, arrived. And you can imagine what a dramatic time that was in the dairy farming industry, and therefore particularly here in Cheshire, uh, one of the main dairy, dairy counties in the country. What's forgotten, I think, about that era is that there was always a, also a big clampdown on pollution from farms. There had been a Control of Pollution Act in 1974, but it was 10 years before the government implemented it. So it was brought into effect in 1984, the same year as the milk quotas. And that really was a double blow to the poor dairy farmers because they suddenly found themselves having to tidy up all sorts of failed drainage problems from the farms. And um, I've, I've, I lost count of the number of farm yards that I did sketch plans of to locate all the drains on them and divert them into large holes in the ground or tanks or whatever else the, the chosen storage was. And of course, that's a story that hasn't gone away since the 1980s. My very short spell with the Government Valuation Service um, saw me actually negotiating some of those management agreements on behalf of um, what well, they still called the Nature Conservancy Council at the time, I'm not quite sure, whoever they were anyway, um, uh, including some quite, quite large ones on the D, D estuary. Um, Harper Adams was, was great, of course, getting the course going there and it became a very successful course and other courses spun off from it, including the postgraduate um, course. Um, and of course, while I was at Harper, we saw the McSharry reforms to the CAP. Um, away from that, in estate management, we saw the 1988 Housing Act reforms. It seems incredible to think that when I qualified, all tenancies were regulated by the 1977 Rent Act, which meant tenanted houses were very unpopular. We've seen the Agricultural Tenancies Act. Milk quotas have now gone again, so it's come full circle. And uh, now we stand on the cusp of a brave new world of uh, farming with uh, all the opportunities or threats, depending on how you wish to see it, that, uh, that the Agriculture Act, new arrangements for international trade, Brexit and all the rest of it uh, to offer. Uh, we're, we're truly the object of that Chinese curse, you know, may your life be interesting. Um, so looking, looking towards a vision of the, the future, I think it's really important for anybody involved in farming and land management to take a broad view just now. I, I think a warning I would give to anybody really is not to hang all your hopes on elms. Elms is certainly going to be important for a lot of farmers in England and its counterparts in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, of course, but it won't be the only opportunity ahead. And um, the pessimist in me uh, looks to agricultural history and uh, I'll share this with your audience today, Tim. This year is the centenary of the Agriculture Act of 1921. I think its proper name actually was the Corn Production Act Repeal Act of 1921. And some of some of your audience may have heard me talking about this before and, and may have come across it otherwise anyway. But it's known to agricultural historians as the Great Betrayal. Why is that? Uh, it's because in 1917, um, a, a Corn Production Act had put in place arrangements to secure food supplies. There was a very primitive submarine blockade which was blocking imports at the time. It was in the First World War, of course. And what the Act did was to promise farmers that they would receive a guaranteed price um, not only for the year in question, but for the three or four years ahead. And the idea was this would allow them to plan for a rotation 
on the farm so they could invest in rotational farming with confidence. The guarantee applied to wheat and oats, not barley. <laughs> Historically, that's of interest. That was a sop to the temperance movement as barley is used to make beer and, 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 and whiskey. In 1920, the government took the view it would be a good thing if this continued into peacetime and they repeated the promise in the Agriculture Act of 1920. Um, and said that they would give three or four years notice of the withdrawal of these support payments. And in 1921, they withdrew them overnight. And uh, governments have a unique ability to renege on their contracts. Um, and that's, that's far too sober a thought, really. But it's, uh, we should always look to history, I think, to see what we can learn about the future. And that's one little snippet that I'd share with you all today um, and you know what what started to happen after 1921 well you had the great depression and you had all the consequences of of, of that uh, where are we standing at the start of 2021 well we've had to spend an awful lot of money on covid and dealing with that as well good thing about that we seem to be emerging from it uh, bad things about that, it has driven, along with other things, some international tensions. Um, pointers from that for the farming industry in particular, we are going to continue needing food. And, and a question then becomes how, how we will produce that food competitively, sustainably, efficiently. Um, and, and in a way which is acceptable to us, and very, very importantly to our consumers as well, our customers. Um, that's part of a vision, I suppose, um, that we actually do keep uh, a decent, wholesome food producing industry in this, this country, um, and that we look to our own resources to do that, rather, rather than relying on other people to support us in doing so. Um, but I also think in a crowded island, um, the vision has to encompass what land management can do to secure the health of the planet. Uh, only in this last week or two, we've seen the Das Gupta review published by government. Um, a light read, if anybody's not had a look at it yet. I think the main report's 600 pages, the summary is 100 pages, um, but there is a couple of page version with the 10, with 10 key headline points on it. Um, what can we most unfairly boil this down to? Um, we, uh, he, he points out that to carry on as we are, we need about another half a planet's worth to sustain us and our demands are growing. That's not a new message. We've been seeing that message um, for, for many years now. Um, but he points out that, that we, we, are, we are dangerously approaching a tipping point where there won't be any coming back. Now, some people are unduly pessimistic about that. I'm, I'm not at the very pessimistic end of it. But I do think that we can't do nothing. We've got to do something. Um, and while we might look to governments to tell us what to do or to do the things, um, I think we should also all be looking uh, at our own little plots um, and so on to see what we can do uh, at home, as it were. And um, although, um, the, um, although it may not seem it to a lot of farmers, to the population at large, farmers are seen as, as a wealthy and privileged group of people. And one's minded of, of, of that passage, which says to those who much is given, much is expected. And I think that's a responsibility that as land managers, um, we must, we must shoulder. In fact, the quotation goes on to say that to those who much is entrusted, even more is expected. And we might say that we have been entrusted with, with great things, and therefore we must shoulder great responsibilities for them. Um, so um, what does that point to for a vision for the future? Uh, I think it points to a vision of the future, which is the countryside is recognised as a complex mosaic of interacting 
things. What a mouthful of garbage that was, wasn't it? But basically that there's a lot going on in the countryside that those who manage the countryside are managing to integrate a lot of competing demands and uses. And uh, some of those will, will be unpopular uses, but I think we have to step up and, um, and, and match them. So growing food, producing energy, um, producing recreation, uh, helping the health of the country, and not only with what we produce for the country to eat, uh, but also in what we provide for the country to tackle its obesity and mental health problems as well. In a way, that brings me back to where I started as that boy growing up in the middle of London who went off to a boarding school in Suffolk, because one of the things I greatly appreciated from uh, living in a small flat in central London was the sense of space and access um, to it. You've heard enough now, Tim. Ask me something else. <laughs> uh, no, Charles, this is brilliant. And it's so, yeah, so fascinating just to hear and kind of get that perspective through history as well and see, you know, do these cycles repeat themselves? And if nothing else, what tales of caution can we, you know, gather from the past and really make sure we're prepared for, for what we're going through today? So I think absolutely fascinating. I think there's something I'm really curious to ask you in here, given kind of your, um, you know, the time you had at Harper and your background and kind of just looking through that, you know, trajectory through time. Do you feel within farming and land management, given the responsibilities of it as a sector, that there are kind of universal principles or um, certain approaches that transcend time? You know, is there a universal principle about looking after land in a healthy, sustainable way that's good for the bottom line, it's good for the environment, it's good for the local community or the public? Like, are there principles that we can, you know, um, pull on um, yes, that we can I, sort of apply to the day-to-day -day farming activities? Yeah, yeah. When we now talk about sustainability, um, I don't think anybody used that word much when I was a student. Um, but a word that was used more frequently then was uh, was stewardship. And, um, you know, your audience might like to um, contemplate, here's <laughs> his, his, mm. his a Harper Adams exam question, compare and contrast stewardship and sustainability. <laughs> but there is something of a theme running through there, isn't there, uh, about keeping a balance. And... Um, uh, again, many, many of our audience today may have come across Garrett Hardin's paper about the tragedy of the commons. Uh, the idea that if you have a common resource, everybody will overuse it to some extent and abuse it. And uh, that's, that, that's a fair enough comment. But actually, if you look at some of the medieval farming arrangements in England, um, where commons were managed by commons councils and, um, and, and, and the like, and there were, there were mechanisms that were set up in society um, to, to make sure that the resource was, was looked after. Uh, simple rotations were undertaken. Um, land was divided as to its quality, so everybody had their fair share. Um, so looking after the um, looking after the resource on which we depend um, is a central tenet, but it's something that we lost sight of, I fear, um, from about the 1950s um, onwards. Um, things which at the time, which were, were great advances, you know, the Green Revolution, and and so on, um, enabled people to be fed, but we now know was over reliant on treating soil as, um, as 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 a simple medium rather than the complex life system which which it is and um and and, and there's you know, I, we've we've moved on from that that now but you know our ancestors would have known that that very well so i think like like any theme through history there are there are, there are ups and downs. And um, the great success since the Second World War of feeding lots of people on the West are really, um, really, you know, balanced and diet and so on. Clearly where lots of us are scoffing far too much of it and there's still great hunger 
in the world. Um, but I wouldn't want to knock that success in actually producing all that food. Um, but we do now need to, to attend to how we make sure that we can continue to produce it. It's like the, the sustainability goals, isn't it? The definition of sustainable development, which it's too easy to trot out all the time, you know, look after our own needs without compromising the ability of the future to look after after their their needs. Um, Charles, I was going to uh, ask on that point about sort of stewardship and also, yeah, just from your experience in, in Harper and the estate management course, is there anything particular that you think should be more widely available from an, uh, a learning and education point of view for rural land managers as we start to go through this uh, transition? Is there anything like, is there new learning that we need to make available? You talk about the complexity of the soil web um, and yeah. kind of some of these other components of access to, um, you know, to land. Do you think there are areas that we need to kind of really open up and look at and explore and, and make more available yeah. to the everyday land manager? Um, interesting that, Tim. Uh, it was always a challenge, and I think it always will be a challenge for people charged with designing land and estate management courses to fit in everything that's needed. Um, when I studied rural estate management, we did a lot on farming, and farming has been squeezed over the years out of rural estate management courses because of all the other demands on the the curriculum that that's a shame but needs must but certainly making sure that the husbandry content of estate management courses is there and perhaps husbandry is the way to approach it because there are some common things which are important to arable farming livestock farming forestry horticulture and all the rest of it and that's one thing but i think the other the other area which is really important to future land managers is confidently using the data and I think that means being really good at using um, GIS systems, finding the data that goes with them. Um, I've been reading um, Alan Spielberger's book, The Art of Statistics, and um, it's told me what big data is, and I'm, I'm really grateful to him because he boiled it down to a load of N's and P's. <laughs> N is the number of items of data you have, um, and P is the number of parameters or, or bits of information you have about each of your your, your subjects and big data is all about handling lots and lots of data samples which might have lots and lots of characteristics and uh, that really struck a chord when I read that because I think that's bang on there's tons of data out there I mean your own land app is is helpful I think to to, to land managers and getting to grips with that but I think you know, uh, an important part of the curriculum for future land managers will be to make sure that they emerge from it um, confident um, in, in accessing, analysing, understanding, using those sources of, of information. Um, so, uh, so yeah, two areas there. there. There could be others I could add as well, Tim, but they, they, they will be two of my top choices, I think. Yeah. That and that's a really interesting perspective because I think we are in a new era where there is data available like there's never been before and it's more accessible than it's ever been. Um, sure. And I think, you know, it's probably a bit my assumption, but I suspect that the natural capital market and ELMS is going to be a very data driven market because if, if government or the private sector corporates are funding land use change, it's critical that they have the data feedback loop to know that the money was spent in the right and appropriate way and delivered the outcomes that were necessary and that can't really be done in analog fa fashion. I don't think, not at scale, which I think is what it needs to be. Uh, I was wondering inside the point of data and big data, um, what are the kind of the key, if, if a land manager was to become proficient with data, what data sets, not, not specifically, but what types of data, we talked about ordnance survey in the preparation for this, the OS um, uh, app and the walking data. Uh, we've talked a bit about soil. What types of, or themes of data do you think are most relevant for the everyday land manager to kind of really get to grips with and know how to use in inside their business? Um, well, I think basic land use data um, yep. uh, 
uh, I've been doing some work in in Scotland um, across quite a large area, and um, we've been trying to use data there on lightly soil carbons, um, mm -hmm. for for example, some peatland soils. Um, we've also been trying to get to grips with um, uh, hydrological data uh, for the area, so water flows, um, catchment details, those sorts of things. Um, and we've been trying to get to grips with recreational data as well. And I think that brings you on to another aspect that there are data sets that you can access. Um, you know, a lot of them aren't easy to understand, but but they're cheap or free in, in a lot of, lot of instances. The, the investment is, is an intellectual one to, to understand them and use them and, and, and get to grips with their limitations. But I think the other thing is gathering the data that you need for whatever you are doing. Um, the example I was just mentioning, um, we are lucky in that the area has a couple of step counters on bridges on key parts in the area. So we know um, how many people have crossed the bridges. Um, they get sabotaged from time to time, but, but we've got some fairly reliable figures. Um, two long distance paths go through the estate and we've got some official statistics on how many people use those as as well um but the ability actually in situations like that to gather your own data and generate uh, data i think will be important as as well for instance uh, just before we went live tim you were talking to me about qr codes on um on visitor boards on the south downs way i think it was you mm. and funny enough that's something which has come up in discussions in Scotland, uh, we might we might put various notice boards here and there with QR codes on, uh, which would encourage people to go to a website and and record their their presence there and tell us a little bit about where they've come from, how long they're staying for, uh, and and what they're doing there, so that we have a better insight into visitors to the area. Um, because we think those data will be useful to us, um, either in um, identifying opportunities, because once you've got some data, you can often find a market opportunity in it. We also think they'll be useful to us in, um, in, in making a case for various proposals in the future. Um, that might be anything from making a case for investment in visitor, facilities for investment in environmental work um, for that matter investment in in development uh, work as 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 well so um so you know gosh it, it, it's as long as it's broad what will we want data on um the um so um so and, and i think i think a key point there is that we will keep finding new things that we want data on as well and that the challenge to land managers then will become not to be bogged down in the wonder of all the data but to get through to actually doing something useful with it at the end of it and kind of reducing it to some some useful action action points i see you've got some questions coming in uh tim you want you go you want to round those up for the end i'm quite happy to pick things up as you go along if yeah, definitely. No, let's cover those in a minute because I think this is the perfect segue. Um, Charles, one of the questions that I <clears throat> I ask is is so I'm I'm here on our 90 acre family farm, and you know we've just covered a lot of ground in what you shared just now. And I, from your perspective, Charles, like you know I know we're a smaller farm than most, but you know how do you how would you advise that we get really business ready? For this transition in the market like what are the actual practical actions that we can take speak people to speak to data to look into um you know what would you say what advice would you give for us as an idea yeah. farm okay um first of all i'd start with where you are yeah um i take it that 90 acre farming is a part-time activity for yourself but i don't think it matters whether you're a part-time or a full-time farmer but uh, get your accounts for the last three years 
um, see which direction uh, your profits are going in, see how reliant you are for any profit at all on payments from, from government. Um, have a look at how your performance compares with other 90 acre farms to the extent that you can. The government spends a lot of money each year gathering the data for the farm business survey. And it must be a terribly underused resource. Um, really but you can go onto the farm business survey website and uh, put your figures alongside the figures from the farm business survey and see how you how you benchmark now if you look at a lot of the main farming enterprises or types for the last however many years several years if you take the top 25% of performers in those surveys and compare them with the average performers um, you will see a pattern whereby the top 25% make more profit before their subsidy payments than the average performers are making with their subsidy payments. That suggests that on the lowland farms, this doesn't apply to the upland farms, I must absolutely emphasize, um, that many farmers might be able to do a lot more to improve their current performance uh, without looking to distracting new enterprises or anything like that at all. You know, that old idea, stick with the knitting, is it? That, they, <laughs> that is one adage that people used to say. Um, so actually I'd start with making sure that your business is in as healthy a position as possible. And I'm more optimistic about the value of doing that now than I was three or four months ago. And the reason I say that is because we did eventually get a trade deal with Europe. Um, so the markets that were there for our, our, our exports of lamb and all the rest of it. Um, admittedly, there's more friction in getting to them, them now, but at least they are still, still there. Um, so there hasn't been the the, the huge economic undermining of the agricultural industry that a no-deal Brexit would have threatened us with, I, I think. So I'd start with what you're doing already. And then um, there are some other things that um, I would start to look at. And this may pick up a theme or two that are coming through in the questions, I think. We know that carbon is going to be uh, very important in the future. If you find yourself of a, a wet Sunday afternoon when recreational tillage is out of the question because it's too wet, um, go and have a look at one of the freely available carbon toolkits. The Farm Carbon Toolkit um, is, 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 is a popular and useful um, one. It was developed by, by a group of farmers and is well well thought of, I think, in a lot of quarters. Um, but it's not the only one. There's the Scottish um, agricultural colleges have one, and there's a few others round and about out there. Um, but it's, it's free to use for farmers. Consultants have to pay a modest amount to use it. And start putting in the details of your farming system and see what your carbon balance is, because I think we're increasingly going to be called upon to account for that. And I think in any case, for a farmer particularly, it, it would be an interesting exercise to undertake. And believe it or not, it, um, it might be a useful exercise in identifying um, where your carbon budget is going. Are you using too much fuel, for, for, for example? Are there ways to cut down um, on that? Some, some of the bigger arable farmers, for instance, by the most meticulous monitoring of their machinery costs, have managed to make great savings on machinery costs. And in doing that, they've made savings on diesel. And in doing that, they have reduced their carbon um, impact. So, you know, what's good for carbon might be good for business as well in that sort of example. So that's that's something that I think you on your 90 acre farm could could quite easily do without any particular specialist training, background knowledge or anything at all like that. The other thing um, that I would play with, I think, on the next rainy afternoon um, would be the, uh, the DEFRA uh, biodiversity metric. 
And again, maybe some of our audience today won't have come across that. So to give a little bit of background to it, Parliament is currently debating an environment bill. And um, it's been put on hold for another six months. But assuming that goes through, sometime in 2022 or 23, um, most planning applications will come with an obligation for biodiversity gain. That means that you have to measure the environment before the development and come up with a plan whereby the environment is 10% better off after you have completed your development. And you'll have to make a biodiversity gain plan to prove that to the planning authority. How to measure this 10% improvement? Uh, the DEFRA biodiversity metric. We don't have the final version yet. There's a version three due in the next month or two, uh, but we do have version two. And um, to listen to some experts pontificating about this, this is a mysterious process which only well-paid experts can, um, can, can use. Um, but if you cut through all that rubbish, um, you can go to the DEFRA website, download the biodiversity metric, and if you know your different land areas on the farm, uh, you can start putting them in. So if you've got some woodlands, some lengths of hedgerow, you know, you, your arab fields, your grass fields, they're all in there. Um, and just have a look at that and see what the biodiversity unit value of your farm is. And again, I think you'll find it an interesting process to go through it and see the relative values. That in itself will have told you something about your farm. But it will also prepare you if there does become an opportunity in the future uh, to, to capitalise on providing biodiversity gain for developments which you might wish to undertake yourself in the future, or where you might want to provide the biodiversity gain for other, other developments in the, in the area. So there we are. That's your homework for this weekend. <laughs> yeah, I know what I'm doing. You're, you're, you're going to look through your farm accounts, do a bit of benchmarking. You're going to look at the farm carbon toolkit, and you're going to you're going to play with the DEFRA biodiversity metric. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's hope it's raining. Um, <laughs> um, really, Charles, that's great, and I'm conscious it's slightly of time. But one of the other questions we asked, and I think that really does um, tear up nicely, is is how can do you think we can turn the UK into a case study for the rest of the world? You know, we are in a massively unique position as a country right now loads of activity underway lots of conversation um is being had at the moment and what do you think you know how could we turn the uk into a case study for the rest of the world to really show how land mm -hmm. and nature can properly be managed and looked after on into perpetuity are we not already a showcase for the rest of the world <laughs> No harm in enhancing that ever so slightly. <laughs> yeah, fly the flag. <laughs> Interestingly, I was uh, I was listening to a webinar yesterday about um, international trade prospects, and one of the speakers was uh, a representative of the United States Department of Agriculture, who's based at their embassy in London, and uh, she was asked what. Uh, what the best prospects were for food exports from this country to the United States. Her, her reply was, was interesting because she said that British food is regarded as very much a premium product by United States consumers. Uh, I mean, that's obvious when it comes to the things like Scotch whiskey, which generally when you look at figures for our food exports uh, may, may make up a big part um, of it. Um, but with the reopening of American markets to beef, um, uh, the possibility of exporting lamb um, there and some of the speciality processed foods as well. Um, you know, there have to be some points in that that you would draw into your question about making us a showcase for the world. I think actually methods of animal production and that quality point um, could could be a really helpful starting point for that. Um, what does the climate of most of the United Kingdom lend itself to growing? Um, grass, really. Um, the uh, we we do grow cereals well and satisfactorily, and we should continue to do so. But but we're not the best place in the world to grow grow cereals uh, whereas we are a good place to uh, to grow grass and to feed animals 
from it. And uh, there's an enormous amount of work that still needs to be done to properly understand, in my opinion, the relationship between grazing animals and grassland um, sequestration. Um, Beef in particular has had a lot of stick uh, for the greenhouse gases, the, the, the methane in particular, that, uh, that comes out of grazing animals. But, um, but no account virtually is taken of uh, whatever is going on in the grassland under their feet. And indeed, some of the work on beef animals has been done on, on intensive feedlots, which mm. is about as far removed from, from grazed beef as it's possible to get. Um, so showcasing some work in that, actually advancing the science in that, I think could be a great opportunity uh, for, for British agriculture. Um, I think the fact that we're a crowded island um, also gives us a good opportunity to be world leading in just trying to move forward on how you reconcile different demands on land. Again, um, without too much apology, I go back to, to where you brought me into this story, Tim, but I seem to remember as a boy that you were never very far from somebody telling you either the Green Cross code about how to cross the road or the country code about how to behave in the countryside. And, um, and I don't seem to see those getting very much prominence in the way of public information now. And, um, you know, I'm sure I'm not alone in uh, wondering who these people are who believe that there are poop bag fairies who will come around the countryside clearing up after their, their dogs. But actually, get, there is an opportunity for us to get a much better public understanding and appreciation of the countryside in every respect, food production, um, environmental benefits, of course. Um, and yet, and yet that's a real crunch tension point, uh, I think, for land managers because of the mess that the great British public is capable of, of wreaking on an area of countryside yeah. in absolutely no time whatsoever. Anecdotal, I know, but and, and everybody on here will have their own anecdotes. But a couple of years ago, I was down at Dur Durdle Door the day after a bank holiday Monday. And what a frightful mess. There were large tractors with big buckets full of bags of rubbish that the rangers there had been collecting from the beach to bring it back up. And there were already big stacks of this stuff around, around the litter bins in the parking area. And you think every bit of that was taken down there by somebody. Why couldn't they just as easily bring it back? And it's it's the same at, at, on, on, on top of some of our, our iconic mountains as well. Uh, and, and lockdown actually has shown that badly because the volunteers who would get out and clean it all up haven't been able to do so. So the rubbish has been um, has been building building up in those areas. Quite shocking. And how do we do that? Education to some extent. Um, uh, and you can't help but think that uh, it should go further than than that if you can uh, if you can go to prison for 10 years for uh, for coming in from a country on the red list perhaps you should go to prison for 20 years for leaving dangerous <laughs> rubbish lying about in the countryside <laughs> yeah i think because that actually touches on a point you mentioned earlier of course public accessing land is massively important for the you know the mental health issues and obesity issues and and of course in terms of elms it's very high likelihood that farmers will get paid for you know providing access to land but of course if the counter side of that is that there's mess everywhere you know that doesn't work so I wonder I mean this is we won't have time for this conversation now but yeah how we take the public on a journey with us and create more transparency into you know what it is to act responsibly within the uh you know the the rural environment um and also potentially you know I, I guess there may be a piece around they are our consumers or they are consumers we are consumers after all um mm -hmm. and of course the more connected they feel to the land and the farming and the farmers then maybe there will be more respect that's born out of that and i think the whole point about qr codes on you know the south downs way maybe if a, a greater story can be told by the farmers about what they do why they do it that might create a some kind of kinship with the public that sort of just otherwise happen to only see the farm through the the, the lens of walking through the, the footpath. So 
Um, Charles, that's brilliant. I am really conscious of time. And of course, there's so much we can talk about, but we have Q&A that we need to get to. Yeah. Um, so let's transition on to that now. Now, um, this is always slightly a challenge for me. So apologies, everyone, if I don't quite manage to get through everything or summarize your question as concisely as I could, because I've got to try and do two things at once. Um, so um, let's have a quick look at what is easy um, and easy to answer as well. Um, yeah, Michael asks a very interesting question about the shift towards conservation and, and, the impair and how important it is to capture information in a, in a uniform um, and representative manner so that the data, the big data that we have mm. allows us to drive insight. Charles, do you have any points on how we sort of start to pick this data up as the everyday farmer in a more concise, in a concise way at least? Yeah, um, I think that um, this reflects something else which has which, which has been suggested that we need common ways of expressing some of these things. Um, but let's stand back from, from that for a moment because um, we don't express distance in the same way that we express volume and we don't express volume in the same way that we express area. Sure, there are some common units that under, underline those things, but essentially if you're measuring carbon, you want to measure it in, in tons of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent. If you're measuring biodiversity gain, then you've got to use the DEFRA biodiversity metric. So I think the real challenge, actually, yes, we do need to have reliable ways to measure things. Um, cliche warning, horses for courses, uh, that what we are measuring uh, must be determined by, by what we're measuring it for. Uh, those of us here who are chartered surveyors, it takes us back to our professional roots, really, <laughs> to, <laughs> with all those chains and, and, and ranging rods and all the rest um, of it. Um, so, um, so, so yes, choosing the appropriate measure for it, and actually, that that is an emerging story. And and if um, if if listeners wanted a, a start point for that. Um, DEFRA has got a section of its website which is abbreviated to ENCA. It stands for Enabling a Natural Capital Approach and there's some quite good introductory material on there and a whole load of follow-up material. And um, for where we are with the development of consistent approaches, one could do worse than have a look at, at that. Michael's also said, and you, you sort of mentioned it in your question there, Tim, that uh, the current focus is more heavily shifting towards conservation. And um, it's, it's a fair point, although I would qualify it, I think, because um, at one point, I think we saw conservation, environmental responsibilities and so on as, as a cost on an estate management or farming business. Um, I think there's also a school of thought which is taking us towards conservation as a source of potential revenue as well. And uh, I mean, I mentioned, I mentioned biodiversity gain as part of the planning system. Even when that comes, um, that will be an opportunity um, for some. It, it, won't, it won't be a free for all by any means, but it will be an opportunity for some. And not least because DEFRA will be obliged to set a price for biodiversity units. In other words, a price which developers can pay if they can't find the biodiversity uh, units to more than offset their development. But the Environment Bill says that price has to be set at a deliberately prohibitively high level. But there are, um, but there are, there may well be other opportunities in future to sell our conservation assets. And, um, so, so yeah. So anyway, Tim, no, that's, I think that's given you a flavour of an answer to that question. No, it has, and it leads perfectly onto a, a combination of <laughs> questions from different people. So, one of the questions, another question is, um, yeah, will carbon? So, I'll, I'll kind of try and summarise a few, and then we can answer them. So, will carbon really primarily be under Elms? Is one question. Uh, could Vincent then asks, could carbon uh, be sold to local companies? I think that's what you mean, um, Vincent. And also Jody asks about carbon taxes. So I just wonder in terms of calculating carbon, is it in Elms? Can it be sold to local companies? Is there going to be a tax for it? What's your sense of that kind of money flow or that opportunity, I guess? Yes. Um, 
I said that a good start point is to do your own carbon assessment using a farm carbon toolkit and to sell carbon to anybody else, you're going to have to have spare carbon to sell. Yeah. Um, so if you are farming and you've got your own carbon deficit, there's arguably a case for saying that you should be buying some carbon from, <laughs> from somebody on a peat restoration project or something of that, that sort. Um, so actually getting some carbon uh, to sell through planting trees, through managing grassland in a certain way, for those farms and, and in the uplands and some in the lowlands, which have got peat uh, areas, which are capable of restoration, there's great things there. We don't have all the mechanisms to sell carbon in that way yet, formally. Um, what we do have is a woodland carbon code and a peatland carbon code. They're very narrow in what they allow you to accept. For instance, you know, healthily growing woodland is continuing to sequester carbon but there is not a formal code under which you can sell that carbon at the moment. You have to be doing it through newly planted woodland, which you have had accepted into the code. It's the same story with peat. Um, peat, uh, peat in a steady state is tremendous at sequestering carbon uh, from, from the atmosphere, but there's no code under which you can sell it. You could sell it informally, uh, but most buyers of it will want something more formal than that so there are markets and mechanisms to be developed to be developed there um, the question about carbon taxes uh, i think it's almost inevitable that we will start to see some carbon taxes uh, in the next couple of years um, the government's biggest priority is probably sorting out the successor to the EU's emissions trading scheme. That's the scheme under which the big generators of carbon, the cement factories, the steel works, the oil refineries and so on, um, had to make a return uh, and buy permits under the EU scheme every year because we've left we, because we've left Europe. We're not part of that anymore, but the government has committed itself to producing a UK emissions trading scheme. It will be a great opportunity if you could offset some of that carbon through land management. So that's something that we should be arguing um, for. Um, but carbon taxes do seem inevitable. And if you look at the, the government produces figures, which it updates from time to time, for, uh, for the cost of carbon or the value of carbon. And the way it works them out is to estimate what's called the marginal abatement cost of carbon. Um, that is to say the effect of, of dealing with the impact of that carbon. Those figures are still somewhat higher than market prices of carbon. And there's a message, there's a message in that somewhere um, about how high you need to push the market price of carbon to make it, to make it pay in that way. Great, great Charles. Um, just really conscious of time and there's some really good questions and again I'm going to try to do my best to summarize them into uh, so one of which is um, how are we uh, progressing with applying valuation principles to natural capital so that's one question Peter asks a great question yeah how do we look at other people countries around the world that are doing great things so New Zealand uh, doing carbon trading or carbon credits great question um, uh, Peter and is there another question to come in? Um, baseline surveys, emerging metrics, in, in, inevitably going to be crucial uh, to unlocking these access to the new schemes. So, is yeah. So, Charles, valuation, what we can learn from other countries, and kind of creating baselines that give you the ability to trade. I guess is the question. Yeah, um, valuation principles. Um, it's a large and complex area. The question of environmental valuation. Um, a tremendous amount to it, but it's, it's an area which continues to develop. There's, there is an incredible amount of data out there already about environmental values. And um, going back to your earlier question of me, Tim, about what does the future land manager need to know, actually that will be another thing on the list to be acquainted with just how those values are derived, how you can produce them yourselves and what it is they're telling you, and just as importantly, what it is they are not telling you. Um, the, uh, I alluded to some element of that with how carbon is costed, for instance, a moment ago. Everybody should be able to do a treasury green book um, 
discounting uh, 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 calculation, the um, 30 years at three and a half percent and the next 20 years at three percent more or less is the answer uh, to, to that. Baseline surveys, yeah, and indeed some of the things that, that I've mentioned are I think amongst the easier starting points for baseline surveys. Ad admittedly the carbon, the carbon calculator is just for carbon and the biodiversity metric is just for that. But more generally having an idea of what it is that you've got um, and that would include things like the lengths of public footpaths and the condition it, it's in. Um, but you know most, most farmers in particular and most land managers will, will have this information readily to hand. Um, it's a question of, of, of getting it down in a way that it can be communicated, I think, with others. But there's there's another piece that maybe just very conscious of time, kind of drawing to a bit of a close now, but maybe it's too big a question to ask at such a late minute, but, but it kind of touched on a few things in terms of the consistency of the data, the baselining, what we can learn from others, how the, the trading can happen from farms, and maybe whether there's a use of AI behind the scenes. It does, kind of all of these questions point towards and, uh, and the valuation principles that underpin all this and how that flows into the biodiversity 2.0 metric and other metrics that come. It's, um, it does feel like it's a very, um, sort of saying it like, really to know what you have is the most fundamental next step any farmer, land manager, advisor can take right now, because irrespective of the way the market goes or the, the mm. opportunities arise, you yeah. wanna be business ready to trade. I, you wanna have some level of data yeah. with some comprehension. I, I agree with that, Tim. And I think if you think of, of what the segments might be in the new markets, um, you know, elms will be a segment. Um, the um, biodiversity gain for development will be a yeah. segment. Um, the, um, a, a, another segment might well be helping companies with their ESG, you know, environmental, social and governance uh, responsibilities. Um, the threshold at which uh, companies have to report on these matters is, is gradually coming down. It started with companies which are listed on the stock exchanges, but now I can't remember the precise figure, but it's companies that are above a certain threshold of staff turnover and various other figures have to include in their annual reports um, a statement about their environmental, social and governance. Uh, accounting and that leads to what they might be doing about it so there is there there, there, there will be a kind of uh, corporate social responsibility market for things and I think that's been hinted at in in some of the questions that I've seen on the chat facility there so thinking about those segments each each of them requires you to know what you've got and what you've got to offer. So at least if you've got that information, um, you're ready to jump when the opportunity comes. And again, the marketing people talk about first mover advantages, don't they? Mm. Uh, yeah. and, um, and so having, having got your act together, you can do that. Um, a salutary tale is that of Shell in the 1970s. Shell is a great believer as a company in scenario planning as a, as, a, as a management technique. And one of the reasons for its great belief in it is that Shell was the first oil company to realize the impact of the light of, of an oil crisis. Uh, and when, when the oil crisis hit in the early 1970s and the Middle East essentially shut off our supplies of oil, Shell had planned for that. It had an awful lot more oil in storage than any of the other oil companies and it propelled it from being one of many oil companies to being one of the largest ones. Um, so, um, so, um, so, so, you know, there are lessons there about preparedness. I think, uh, I think this is absolutely brilliant. And I think Charles, what all this also points to slightly is you know in land management 2.0 we're going to continue to have further conversations that follow these different threads and I think it's such a huge subject that's so broad and has so many different avenues to, to, to look into that you know we're going to really do our best to kind of open it up and it would be great to hear from the audience you know through emails or whatever um, about the different formats that we can sort of share this educational material whether it's through workshops the live sort of Q&A round tables where we have more discussions or sort of more evenings with which is sort of a fireside chat kind of conversation mm. and everyone can kind of chat and share ideas so if anyone has any ideas please do get in touch because we're really keen to facilitate as much of this as possible and 
just conscious it's just gone past half past nine. Um, so the, yeah, I probably, I guess we should start wrapping up now really Charles. And I think, you know, we've covered so much ground and I think hopefully everyone's gonna have a lot to digest. I've taken lots of notes myself. We'll be sending out the recording afterwards. So please do follow up. And if you're not on the community channel at the moment um, do jump on our website, join the community. You're welcome to sort of write a message to Charles there and hopefully Charles, you'll be able to just get in touch with a few people. But um, right. yeah, have you got any closing remarks actually, just in terms of summarizing what we shared and kind of actionable next steps for people? Uh, some very interesting questions, which it would have been interesting, great to go on and discuss, but time's done what time time does, hasn't it? I'm, I'm afraid, but perhaps we can pick those up you know, on, on online sometime. The, um, I think I've made the point several, um, sev several times, Tim, that, you know, don't, don't wait for the answers to come at us. Be prepared to answer these questions yourself. Um, uh, try and make sure that you understand all the dimensions of your rural business, your land holding or whatever. Um, you know, start with the simple stuff um doing some work with a large estate in scotland we literally started with bits of a3 paper and sketched the estate and um and just drew on it what we thought were the main main assets of it and uh, that that was a great foundation for the work and uh, play with some of these tools that i've mentioned and and any others that you can put your hands on as well brilliant. that's my closing brilliant. brilliant thank you so much charles that's absolutely fantastic and um yeah i should probably just mention actually we've had some a few interviews we've done already with alex robinson rg ruggles bryce etc so those are on our website to go or youtube channel go and have a look at those because they're very instructive as well and next week we've got um paul barnes um from the ormsby estate who's going to be talking about diversification and what they're doing to get prepared for this we've got patrick holden coming up about the sustainability metrics and how to get business ready with some of the data uh, we've also got John T. Brunny from Farm Edge, who's going to be sharing a bit about how to get ready with regenerative agriculture. So those are all coming. So lots of more fun conversations to have. So yeah, let's keep um, yeah, building this conversation together and do what we can to, you know, turn the UK into a case study for the rest of the world. I think we've got everything ripe and ready for us. It's just about coming together and building those systems and solutions. So um, yeah, thank you very much, Charles, for your time. Really grateful for you sparing this morning. Thank you, everyone that's joined. And uh, yeah, look forward to being in touch very soon. Thank you very much, Tim, and thank you very much, everybody, for uh, for joining us today. Cheerio. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye.